Dr. Margaret Bennett, who will give the chief's address. Margaret. The Harton, Hamilcar Falter de Vula, and Krinichan Show. I wish I honored more, more goes at the Gayano. Get the highest cards that here at Bliana, or Miliana Yarley, as Lachal Lodger. Han Kusperschen has go my mat loo, is a hula clear on the show. Friends, I'm honored to welcome you all as friends who share the values of our forebears. It's an honor for me to be chief of a society that has inspired me for years. It was such a surprise that I, as the society might tell you, thought long and hard about it. I thought of Professor Blackie, Mary McKellar, of the names, the great names, McBain, Mackay, Mackenzie, names that have lit my path over years. I would have to admit that the first time I heard of the Gaelic Society of Inverness was not in my schooling in Scotland, but as a student in Canada. When my professor of folklore said to me, you're going to be a folklorist, I take it you've begun to read the transactions of the Gaelic Society of Inverness. I have all the volumes here except one. I want you to look for that when you go to Scotland next and let me know. That was maybe a daunting task, but it was something that filled me with inspiration. And so when asked to accept this honor, my hesitation initially was that I might walk in their shadow until I woke up and I thought, no, I walk in their light. They have lit my path. And as such, I would accept this with great feeling and honor indeed. There can be few people here who've been to Culloden for the first time you remember that day when you realize Culloden wasn't just a date on our calendar. For myself, and I hope you don't mind if I'm a bit personal in this address, I remember the impact asking my grandfather, John Stewart, Shenner, how long have our family lived in the north of Skye? And alas, in English, he replied, because Gaelic, in my generation, I was of those enlightened parents who thought that it wouldn't do us any good. He replied, we've been here since Culloden. We were stewards of Appen. And he said no more. But I remember that feeling when I stood by the mass graves, not just of the stewards of Appen, but of every other fallen hero and remembered how they attained those graves. But when we remember them, we need to remember too that it wasn't and is not a Scotland-England conflict. It wasn't a Highland-Lowland one, nor a Protestant-Catholic issue, as some might think. There were Protestants and Catholics on both sides, and many of the Jacobites were Episcopalians. It's not even a cause that can be claimed for clans. There were MacDonalds and MacLeods on both sides. Families split down the middle. Wives who raised Jacobite supporters behind the backs of their Hanoverian husbands. There were brothers fighting against brothers. The 45 is one of the most complex and misunderstood episodes of our history. An episode with far-reaching effects not only on the Highlands, on Scotland, on Britain, but on the world. We might for years, and people have for years, argue the finer points of the historical facts. But if we miss the emotional truth of this place and of this day, we've missed the point completely. And to search out that emotional truth, we must turn to the culture of those who served and those who fell. Virtually all the songs and the poems of the time are Gaelic. There's one Jacobite song in English of the time, that's Johnny Cope. Others have been written afterwards, but those of the time are all in Gaelic. There is, as far as we know, no song or poem in existence of an anti-Jacobite nature. That must speak volumes. So if we listen 
to the Gaelic poetry and songs of the time, the actual time, from the hearts and the minds of the men and women who were actually engaged in Bliel Mahyali or fell on Lago Lodger. Then we begin to understand. And unlike many wars that are fought today over land or resources, golden days gone by, oil today, this was a cause that was rooted in a recognition that the rich culture of the Gael was under threat. It might be lost forever if the people themselves did not take a stand. One completely unknown woman in Edinburgh, a Gael, addressed her husband, Alan. Helen, Helen, Satan cattle, and the shake of garams and lot lassig, a green kirir and yachking, sat of one hin look num brechken, who got a he, who got a man, who got a he, read you, oh, he you, who got a man. Helen, the in Gavskine's begeri, Chin of the Klein is kind of themor, the Alapa for the Vin and Pastion, Marijan and Mangerini, O Korahi, O Koraman, O Korahi, Riri, you, O Hilu, O Koraman. Brown-haired Alan, wake, rise, gather your clan, remember your need of them, for great Scotland will be under the sentence of doom unless her own people defend her. Composed in 1745 or maybe six, how timeless this trumpet call. 268 years on, it's still true that great Scotland will be devoured if our own people don't take a stand. For our culture to flourish, we must, must take a stand. At the time, some of the bards knew the prince personally, such as Colonel John Stewart of Badenoch. He fought in the front line of battle and afterwards composed his song. Mochrach Jarli, Rua Boyach, Vikajija Heg George and Mbiest. Alas, the handsome red haired Charles should be condemned by that monstrous Lord, and this condemnation of our justice, our truth, is brought low to the very lowest. O oh God, if it be your will, set this kingdom on a course, for it has been taken away from us. Place the true and the rightful king over us while this generation lives. But of course that wasn't to happen. And at the end of the day, after the battle, when he saw the reality for himself, his last verse, and I think that although the words carry emotion with the tune, then I think that emotion can reach where it's supposed to reach. Mochrach von a kurkilial, an a lion is leeching out how, can a hishtu can lynchen, can a lochag hain ounce no twain. Chapio, you and Jeskeli sat the brie, ye hail and a loin, or no wigs and tall hain yin, is ha hanig at rebaldy grain. Alas, the bright white bodies are lying on the moorland here, without coffins, without shrouds, without even a burial, but holes in the earth. Those that have survived are scattered, or they're packed up in ships, crushed together. Nobody could fail to be moved by what he described. And yet there were nameless widows, orphans, mothers, bereaved men and women who lived. We need to teach our children. This is what happened. Not in ways of numbers but in the sense that this was one view of humanity. I'm forever, I will forever remember a newscast that came out and all of us lived through this when the massacre in Bosnia, 
much of an card and the news flash and the gunfire and the horror of that. Every man, brother, husband, son, butchered, women raped. And my own son, who was 22 at the time, turned to me and he said, as he gasped, he said, Sing it, Mom, sing it. And translated it means, You have killed my brothers. You've murdered my husband. You've even stripped and raped our women. But yet, had the cause won, the pain might be less. And in her words, it's this. But they were the first of generations to be affected by the aftermath. Yet, this is not a cue for us all to fall into that role of victim. Instead, we can turn it into a time of reflection on the impact of that time on our language, on our culture, on our values. It was not only those who followed the prince who were affected by the government's act of prescription, for example, for no matter whether they fought as Jacobites or Hanoverians, they would have to denounce all weaponry and instruments of war, and their society too would be forever changed. But least expected was the total ban on Highland dress. The humiliation, the indignity, the stripping not only of a tradition, of an identity, but their only clothes they knew how to wear. Yesterday was Good Friday. La Nikesa, Marachanishin and Gaelic, the crucifixion day as we see in Gaelic, when Christ was stripped of his garments, the dignity that was recognized to his companions, to his mother, he was stripped of that. And it's worth taking a moment to remember in that context too what the words of the actual act said. From the 6th, so pardon me, this is 1746, September. From the first day of August, 1746, no man or boy within that part of Britain called Scotland, other than such as shall be employed as officers and soldiers in His Majesty's forces, shall on any pretext whatsoever wear or put on the clothes commonly called Highland clothes. That is to say, the plaid, the filibeg, the little kilt, the trues, shoulder belts, or any part whatsoever that peculiarly belongs to Highland garb. By the way, that's the socks or the that the woven footwear. And no tartan or even partly coloured plaid or stuff shall be used for great coats or upper coats. And if any person shall presume after the first day of August to wear or put on the aforementioned garment or any part of them, for the first offence they will be liable to be imprisoned for six months and on the second offence to be transported to any of his majesty's plantations beyond the seas and there to remain for the space of seven years. It's the ultimate indignity to be stripped of your clothing. And those who pledged loyalty to King George discovered that had no rewards for them for they too had to relinquish the clothing, the garment the tradition that had been theirs, and there would be no freedom in their culture. Reflecting on the spirit of the Gale, or reflecting the very spirit of the Gale, Duncan Ban McIntyre, although he fought at Falkirk, he considered his life and the ability of the Bard, 
worth saving for descriptions of this and other battles and the aftermath. He composed his Orant and Vrigish, the Ode to the Trousers, the loss of the Highland dress, the only clothing they knew how to wear. Sorry, Lee, or Farewell to the plaid. I have a great affection for it. I enjoyed wearing it, and always above the knee. The pleated around my waist. He was probably the first and the most recognised who confidently wore it after the act was repealed, as he and Mary, his Mary Van Ock were seen in Edinburgh, not just Duncan wearing his plaid, and they waited a long time for that, but Mary, for good measure, sporting a red cloak that you might not miss them. But Gales were to wait a full generation for that, for the act was repealed by George III in 1782. And meanwhile, it was the perfect lure to fill the ranks of the British Army with kilted Highlanders, highly trained, with an unquestionable loyalty that had been hard, part of their culture for time immemorial. Yet in Scotland today, we don't have to go very far to sense a tartan cringe. Even some eminent historians voice opinions that belittle our pride in wearing tartan. Some even cite or blame Sir Walter Scott's role for dressing King George IV in tartan during the first royal visit after the act was repealed. But surely this is a complete misunderstanding of both the facts and the motives. There seems to be much, much more for us to gain in considering that Scott was the, took the very first opportunity possible to dress the monarch in the very fabric and dress that the government had banned. I would consider that a tour de force by all descriptions. And this is our cue also to reclaim that confidence and not to cower and continue to cower behind the blame. Culloden cast a huge shadow on all our people right across the world. But as I reminded myself earlier, where there's a shadow, there is also light. You cannot have a shadow without light. And we can walk in that light. As this year we celebrate Homecoming Scotland 2014, we welcome thousands of returning Highlanders, Lowlanders, Jacobites. We, many will wear tartan. And despite the fact that generations have passed since their forebears left the old country, they will tell us that still the heart is Highland. As they speak of their Highland forebears who were Gaelic speaking, they regret the loss of a language, yet today there are apparently more Gaelic learners in North America than in Scotland. As we share with them the diverse ways of celebrating Highlandness, it's time for Scots the world over, and especially in Scotland, to pay more attention to what's behind their celebrations. In attending this ceremony of remembrance for all who fought and died in Culloden 268 years ago, we remember not only the individuals who died, but with them the demise of traditional values of the society of the Gael. In gathering together here, we reaffirm our commitment to those values. Honesty, loyalty, integrity, trust, fairness, faithfulness, justice, devotion. Values that are endangered in modern society and in some areas totally lacking. And if you go to any great Highland Games gathering across the world, whether it's Grandfather Mountain, wherever, before you start to comment on what you see, think on it that these people are there because they believe in those values and they struggle to attain them today and to find them there they can be surrounded by them and it's in that light that we can go forward in the hope that the language and the culture that the Jacobites fought for will be valued again and flourish as it did in the past.
could I now ask Beardy Smith to lay a wreath on behalf of the National Trust? Those of you who now want to lay a wreath on behalf of whatever group you represent, I'm going to ask you to come forward. Once you've laid your wreath, to come up to the microphone and announce who you're representing. We don't allow anybody to make a speech merely to mention who you're representing here today. From the 15 of the Northumbrian Jacobite Society, in memory of all those who suffered and died in the risings of 1715 and 1745. In memory of all those who fought and fell, and in honor of their bravery, from Count Peter Polinski, and all other descendants of Prince Charles Edward Stuart. <laughs> the 1745 Association, in remembrance of all who died here. 